these three images all share two things in common. One, they're activities that I like to engage in during the summer. And two, they're all centered around water. These kinds of activities and activities like them are ones that many people like to engage in, but very few think of the cost of. Because why would they? Water is essentially free, isn't it? I could, say, run this shower head for the duration of my presentation, and it's not that big of a deal, is it? Well, let me come back to that. Let me first tell you a story. On the day of my eighth birthday, I was awoken at three in the morning by the sound of firefighters at our door. Apparently, a local forest fire had gotten out of control, and we were being evacuated for safety reasons. Now, I didn't really care about safety reasons. I wanted my birthday, but we had to leave. And when we came back, there was a noticeable change in the city. There was a layer of ash over everything, even ash in the sky that changed the color of the sun. Uh, the lake had changed too. The water levels had dropped noticeably. And at the age of eight, I was astounded that anything, even as severe as a forest fire, would have such a strong effect on something as large and what I thought was unchangeable as a lake. Let me fast forward a few years. At the age of 13, summer was fast approaching and my parents were trying to get me out of the house. They suggested a summer camp. Now, I had done the regular summer camp thing with canoe trips and fires and industrial grade spaghetti, but that wasn't really what interested me that summer. Uh, no, I had developed a passion for video games. I really liked those sim ones, the ones where you build the city and manage resources. And so, that summer, I decided to join a two-week course at my local college to learn how to program video games. As you can imagine, I was a pretty uh, pasty 13-year-old. You see, despite my love of nature, a love that I believe we all share, uh, there was another fundamental joy that called my name that summer. From carpenters to creative writers, many people find a draw towards the act of creation. And it was this act of creation that I wanted to partake in that summer. The idea of going from nothing and then writing a few lines of code to create a world and the characters within it and, and the rules that they abided by, it, it fascinated me. Back then, I was creating virtual worlds to get myself out of the house. Now, more than a decade later, I'm using the same fundamental principles and motivations to create virtual versions of the real world so that I can assess how people's interactions with each other and their environment can have an effect on something as large as water, the lifeblood of the world. You see, water is a very interesting thing. It has a lot of unique properties that make it very special. And it's also special in its ubiquity. Every organism that we know of on this planet Earth uses water, and it's necessary for their life. In developing countries or areas where there's been a natural disaster, establishing a clean source of drinking water is often the number one priority. Now, despite this widespread acceptance of its importance, many people in developed nations, such as those within North America, don't really think twice about their water use. In areas with seemingly large supplies, people will undervalue the resource. And undervaluing something as important as water can have dire consequences. Let's consider Australia for a second. Now, Australia has rivers which no longer reach the ocean. They've been sucked dry of all of their water before it has a chance to reach the shores. And even this is not enough to quench their thirst. And so they must build desalination plants at the cost of between one and two billion dollars a piece to turn salt water into fresh water through the use of immense amounts of energy. Now, you might have noticed that earlier I just said that areas with seemingly large supplies tend to undervalue the resource. Now, the reason I emphasize seemingly is that in many places where the average citizen might consider there to be a relatively unlimited amount of water, there's actually a myth of abundance, and this perception of plenty is false. Let's consider the city we're in today as a case study, Kelowna, BC. Now, Kelowna is a semi-arid desert, but if you were a visitor in the summertime, you wouldn't notice. You would drive through the city, and you might look out your window and see people watering their extremely green lawns, or you might see any number of people in their backyards in large open pools, or if you're driving downtown, you could see any number of fountains just spewing water into the air. 
And it's these kinds of activities that contribute to this pervasive myth of abundance. Because people see others using water like this and they think, well, they're using it like that. Surely we must have enough. Clearly I can use it like that too, can't I? Well, perhaps not. Let me just shift gears for a second here. I want to get an idea of what kind of conservation behavior you all engage in. So I'm going to ask some questions, and if you guys do any of the following, just please raise your hand to give me an idea of what this audience is like. So uh, how many of you like to take extended showers? Maybe you like the heat, maybe you do some of your best thinking there. Okay, about a third of the audience. Um, and on a hot day, how many of you might turn on the tap and let it run for 10 or 15 seconds before taking a glass, just so it's extra cold? Even more, about half of the audience. Um, and now this last one, how many of you follow that old saying, if it's yellow, let it mellow? <laughs> Considerably less hands, some embarrassed faces, but thank you for you, those of you who do. That's a great way to save water. Uh, because flushing a toilet, many people don't realize this, but it can use upwards of 25 liters of water per flush. That's on the left-hand side. Now, I have a few other uh, regular fixtures that people use, a faucet, uh, showering, uh, washing machines using immense amounts of water. But if you're one of those people that let it mellow, uh, you could be affecting upwards of 30% or a third of your water use indoors, at least. Uh, as you can see, the toilet accounts for about 29%. Um, and this can have a big effect overall. Now this just considers indoor usage. This doesn't consider outdoor usage, such as irrigation, which can account for sometimes two to three times as much water usage. And at that point, I want to ask one more question of you. I want to get an idea of how much water you think we use on a regular basis. So I'm going to start listing some numbers, and if you think that we use that amount of water per day, per person, or more, just put your hand up. So how many of you think that we use five liters of water per person per day or more? Most of the audience. How 10? 25? How about 50 liters? 100 liters per person per day? Okay, it's about half the audience. 200 liters? 400? Okay, very few hands still up. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news for all of you, but in the middle of the summer, at the peak of the dry season, we use upwards of 1,000 liters of water per person per day. Now that's an astounding number. What would that even look like? Well, it's about six and a half bathtubs full per person. And this is one of the four reasons that make Kelowna a worst case scenario for water sustainability and one of the four reasons that we need to change this myth of abundance. So in addition to our extremely high usage, a usage that is more than double the national average, we also have the least available fresh water in the country. Now this may surprise some of you who live here as we live beside a very large lake, but what you might not know is that during the summertime, at the peak of the heat season, there is upwards of one meter of water being evaporated from the top of the lake. Now in addition to this extremely high usage and this extremely low availability, we are also the fourth fastest growing metropolitan area in the country, meaning that the demand for water will not slow down if we don't change our perceptions about this valuable resource. And finally, we are also home to the rarest ecosystems in the country, with areas of the highest biodiversity in the country. So it's clear that we need to do something to try and protect these lands. But how do you address something as large as water use? Well. Complex problems need creative solutions. With the power of modern computing, we can now combine scientific data of different faculties in ways that were previously impossible to try and answer some of these questions empirically. Scientists use something called models to answer these types of questions. Now models are simpler representations of more complex problems. In my work at the university, I create uh, something called an individual-based model of the city of Kelowna and its residents. So first I create the environment, and I do this using something called GIS data. What you're seeing here is Kelowna. The white represents non-residential area and the bounds of the city, and the different colors that you see represent different types of residential areas. So it's quite small, but you can see some red right in the middle, 
uh, and also near the edges. That is the high density residential areas, whereas the blue is single family homes, that sort of thing. Now, once I've created this virtual environment, I create the virtual residents. So these residents are the ones that will populate my virtual version of Kelowna. And I inform their different types of personality using survey data. So I can look at different response patterns within the survey data and create generalized personality types of the people within Kelowna, put those into the environment to create a more realistic representation of the city. So once you've combined these two, you then have a working simulation or a game of sorts. And this game lets you test things out. You can look at future scenarios. So if you change the way that the government did water policy, how would that affect water usage within the city? If you change the growth scenarios from densification to urban sprawl, how would that have an effect? If you change the way that people had access to information, what would that do? And you can even look at the social interactions between these agents, and you can see how having even one person with a strong attitude and a large voice, how that can affect the spread of information and conservation in general. So, to give you an example of what this might look like once it's finished, this is uh, three simulations running that show the difference that a subsidy to conservation technologies, so think better irrigation systems, uh, or improved uh, indoor toilets and showers and that sort of thing, the effect that it can have on water usage. So you can see on the left-hand side, there is more conservation, which is represented by a lighter color of, color of blue. And then on the right-hand side, you see the darker colors. And the animation that you're seeing is it just running through one year of a simulation. And so this can be looped for multiple years or to test different scenarios. So some of you might be wondering about that shower head that I started way back when. Any guesses on how much it would have used? Well, in the approximately 12 and a half minutes of this presentation so far, there's been 250 liters wasted if this would have actually been on. Don't worry, no water was wasted in the making of this video. <laughs> but it does present an interesting point. Think of that in terms of bottles of water and just let it sink in. How much, how long would you have to stand there pouring bottles of water over yourself to get 250 liters? It's a very remarkable amount. Now, I want to leave you with a few things. First of all, be mindful of the way you use resources. Regardless of how plentiful you may think something is, it may just be the case that there is a myth of abundance where you live. You have an effect on your environment and those around you. We are, after all, part of the environment. We are not separate from it. And don't let it take something like an unexpected event, such as the forest fire from my youth, or the droughts that we're seeing in California today, to change your perception about this, because that may be too late. Look at what happened to California after just three years of drought. This is a single water basin that is now left virtually dry. And additionally, if these sorts of complex problems interest you, or like me, you had a passion for video games in your youth and you'd like to turn that into something a bit more scientific, I encourage you to look at scientific modeling. It is a great way to address real problems. I use my passion for video games to create a game of sorts of water use in the city that I call home to try and address a problem, this myth of water abundance. What will your game look like?